Hey, everybody. Sean Gibbons from the Communications Network. Hope you are doing well and staying healthy today. Uh, you are in the right place if you'd signed up for a webinar called Leading with Stories with Andy Gooden. I'm not sure if you can see him yet, but you will in just a moment. He's put on a really just tremendous presentation, been a chance to look through it. So I know you're all in for a treat. We have a huge number of folks who signed up for this. I'm actually watching you all come into the lobby just now. 115, 120 keeps ticking up. Kind of looks like what the stock market's doing, but in the right direction going up rather than down. Uh, suffice to say, we had 700 people sign up for this webinar, which is a tribute to how well thought of Andy is and deservedly so. Uh, but what it practically means is we have, I think, a limit of 500 seats. So if you have a colleague who's sitting just down the hall, maybe having some trouble getting in, please let them know they can follow along. We're going to be making notes on all of this through ComNet Live. That's the hashtag COM. N-E-T-L-I-B-E, -E, our good friend Yabby Ferris is manning that, should be making notes along the way. We'll also be, as we always do, recording this. So there'll be a YouTube video available for you to watch on demand uh, whenever you like, and knowing that there's a lot of popularity with this particular topic, we'll turn that around as quickly as we can. I expect you'll see it certainly within a week, or perhaps even quicker. Uh, what else do I need to tell you? A couple logistical items. There's a chat box down there in the corner, if you hover with your, your cursor or your finger, or whatever it might be you're using. Um, go ahead and open that up, and if you would, since there are a lot of us here, would you, would you go ahead and type in your name, where you're from, and what organization you represent, and if you have something you're in particular you're interested in chit-chatting about or learning about, go ahead and throw that in there too. We'll take questions along the way, about halfway through, and then again at the end, Andy's going to close out with a story, so you get a sense of what's ahead in just a minute. Uh, what else do I need to tell you about? You can upvote for questions, so questions should go, hey, Francesca, Dale, Tiana, Jeannie, if I got that right, Tracy, Sarah, Krista, Alex, Katie, Dacri, Laura, Krista. Oh my goodness, y'all are going way too fast. Hey, Sean Blitch, Sarah Billups, Kim and Sarah, Abby, Jennifer, Mara, Sandy. I'm not going to keep going, guys, because y'all are going way too fast for me. Suffice to say, uh, the last thing I need to tell you is you're all chatting in the chit chat box. That's awesome. Talk to one another, share information. We'll be passing in some of the links that Andy's going to refer to. Look for those in the chat box. We'll also have a little worksheet to give you with links for all this stuff that we'll pass along at the end of this whole proceeding. Hey, Jordan. Hey, Emily. How are you? Uh, in addition, there's a Q&A box. So if you just look a little bit to your left past the chat box, Q&A, that's where you'll put the questions. That's where I'm going to go looking for them anyway. And we will get to as many of those as we can. Andy, of course, graciously, as he always does, is happy to take your questions offline if we don't get to everybody's, but we're going to do our darndest to stay with us. Andy's got to catch a flight. Uh, brave thing to do, but, but the world goes on, at least for now. Uh, and so he's able to stay with us, I think, about 10 minutes past the hour. So we will try to extend our Q&A session as long as we reasonably can, but also make sure he gets to where he needs to go. All right, so with that, hey, Wilda, Kelly, Claire, Megan, goodness, all my friends are on here. This is awesome. Cassandra, uh, Siri, and Zest, if I'm remembering that right, from Memphis. What's going on? Rebecca Griffin in San Francisco, Essie in DC, Dory, Caroline. All right, I'm going to have to stop. I'm psyched to see you all, at least virtually. Hope you're all well. I'm going to go ahead and pass it along to Andy. You want to go ahead and take it away, sir? Thank you, Sean. Welcome, everybody. It's Andy Goodman from the Goodman Center in Los Angeles. Welcome to Leading with Stories. Here's what we're going to do in a very fast hour today. First, I want to talk a little bit about just a reminder of why storytelling is so powerful. I think it's the single most powerful tool that you have. So we're going to talk about how stories help us remember and how stories influence how we think and behave. After that, we'll stop and take questions for a minute to make sure we're all on the same page. And then we're going to talk about our main topic today, why you as leaders of change must tell three stories. And we're going to bring into the room virtually uh, the work of Marshall Gans. And we'll finish by talking about how you develop your story of self. We'd like you to understand the model of these three stories, one of them being the story of self. And by the end of today, how you can do it, we're gonna provide you with a template to do that as well. We'll finish up with some more questions. But before we get to any of that, for those of you who I've not met before and you're wondering, what qualifies you to teach me about storytelling? Let me give you the most important part of my CV right now. I am a graduate of the Walt Disney and Jim Henson School of Storytelling. And if you're thinking to yourself, gosh, I didn't know there was a Walt Disney Jim Henson School of Storytelling. Uh, there isn't, I just made that up. Uh, that building, I think that might be from Duke University actually. Uh, but I'm not lying to you because back in the early 1990s, 
on the ABC television network, there was a program on Friday nights that was a Walt Disney, Jim Henson co-production. And I was a writer on that program. So for three years, for three seasons, I worked very closely with the Disney and Henson people. And I got to tell you, if you want to learn about storytelling, you could do worse than to work with the Disney and Henson people. And if you're wondering, what show was that? Maybe I saw it. Well, this was 20 years ago. And this being a webinar uh, attended by very bright, caring people, uh, you probably never saw it. But just for the record, it was a show on ABC called Dinosaurs. Um, anybody remember this show? It was on Friday nights back in the early 90s. Uh, funny thing about this show, as I said, I was a writer on this show. We, the writers, thought we were writing this very witty social satire. Uh, but um, 20 years later, when I meet people who remember the show, the only thing they seem to remember is this. Want to give daddy a kiss? Dad, he's starting to bother me. <laughs> I'm glad to see so many of you remember the show. So I want to ask, where were you when they handed out the Nielsen boxes, okay? <laughs> anyway, I worked on that show for three seasons, learned an awful lot about storytelling. But then I quit the TV business and I went to work for a nonprofit here in Los Angeles called Emma. This was started by Norman Lear and some of his friends uh, to basically be the nexus, the connecting point between the environmental community with all the important messages it has to get out and the entertainment industry with its huge megaphone for getting out messages. And specifically our strategy at Emma was to work with writers and producers of TV shows and movies trying to convince them to put environmental messages into their stories. So the idea is you're sitting at home, watching your favorite primetime show, minding your own business, and all of a sudden, the characters are talking about recycling <laughs> or global warming or what have you. Well, I ran that organization for five years. That got me into the nonprofit world here in Los Angeles. And that's where I started to meet lots of nice people like you, people at nonprofits, foundations, government agencies, colleges, universities, people who in some way, shape or form we're trying to make the world a better place. And what I noticed meeting people like you at conferences and workshops and various gatherings was that when it came to talking about what you did, well, maybe there you could use a little help. So in 1998, I started my own firm called the Goodman Center with the express purpose of helping people at nonprofits, foundations, government agencies communicate more effectively, primarily through story. And over the years, we've done over 500 workshops with nonprofits, foundations, government agencies, colleges, universities, even some corporate clients, kind of a representational group of the people we've worked with. And we've also been fortunate enough to work around the world. We work with CARE in Guatemala, First Nations tribes in British Columbia, ALU down the bottom there, that's the African Leadership University in Mauritius. We work with people all over the globe. And We've learned an awful lot about storytelling in that time. And one of the things we've learned is that no matter where you go, no matter how different people are, they all tend to tell stories the same way. There are certain universal rules and principles that you can, you can follow. So what we're gonna do now is talk a little bit more about why stories are so powerful, how to tell a good story, and then we'll get into these stories that leaders of change must tell. So first of all, Let's talk about how stories help us remember. And there are many studies that have proven this, but there's one in particular I like that was done a few years ago at the University of Minnesota. And you know, just you know, stop and, and take a moment to think about this. If somebody tells you something and you instantly forget it, right? You know, in one ear, out the other, you know what I mean? That piece of information, it's gone. Game over. No chance to affect how you think and behave again. But if somebody can tell you something in a way that makes it stick in your brain and stay there, then it has a chance to affect how you think and behave. And stories have that power. And as I said, there was a study done at the University of Minnesota uh, with five-year-olds that illustrates this beautifully. So I wanna tell you about this quickly. So imagine a, a class filled with five-year-olds, I guess this would be kindergarten or pre-K. And one day the teacher says to the kids, Kids, we have a very special visitor today from the University of Minnesota, and she's here and she wants to play a fun game with you to test your memories, okay? So please give her your full attention. 
and the researcher steps forward and says, okay, kids, here's how the game works. I'm gonna hold up cards, like you see in this illustration, with two sides, two panels. And there's gonna be pictures of two things, like this. She holds up the first card, and on the left, there's a bar of soap, and on the right, there's a shoe. And she says to the kids, in this game, that's our first pair. Soap goes with shoe. That's what I want you to remember, soap and shoe, okay? Can you remember that, kids? And the kids are all like, uh-huh. That's good. So, okay, now I'm gonna hold up a second card. And this one has, let's say, uh, a baseball bat and a bucket of paint. She says, I want you to remember that too. Soap and shoe, bat and paint. Okay, you still with me, kids? Uh-huh. She holds up a third card. This one has, let's say, a daisy and a cloud. She says, I want you to remember that too. Soap and shoe, bat and paint, daisy and cloud. And she holds up for the kids 21 cards. 21 pairs for the five-year-olds to remember. And she says, okay, kids, that was a lot to take in, I understand. So let's do this, let's take a break, go out in the playground and play for an hour, one hour. <laughs> she brings it back in one hour later, and she says to the kids, all right, <clears throat> here comes the second half of the game. This is the really fun part. I'm gonna hold up the cards again with the two pictures, but this time, one of the pictures is going to be missing, and you have to tell me what's missing. So everybody got the scenario here? One hour later, 21 pairs. How many can the five-year-olds reconstruct? What do you think? Take a moment to, to make a guess. If you want to put in the chat box, out of 21 pairs, how many do you think they could put back together? Rick says five, three, zero, zero or one. Yeah, if you're, if you're, if you're at the bottom end of the scale, you're right. It was one one out of 21, because let's face it, they're five, <laughs> okay? All right, we're just getting started. Our researcher now goes to another school on another day, fresh new group of five-year-olds, same 21 pairs, but this time there's a twist. This time she says to the kids, as I hold up each pair, I'm gonna call on one of you to put the words in a sentence for the whole class to hear. So she holds up the first pair, soap and shoe, and she looks around the room and she says, Okay, uh, five-year-old uh, Marcus, uh, would you please put these words in a sentence for the whole class to hear? And Marcus thinks for a second and says, uh, the soap is in my shoe. Thank you, Marcus, <laughs> future novelist. <laughs> the soap is in my shoe. The kids hear 21 sentences with the words in them, go out and play for an hour, bring them back and test them. Compared to the first group that only remembered one pair, could only reconstruct one, how do you think this group did? Same, better, worse? Again, give me a number. I see the numbers have gone up this time. Yes, eight out of 21 pairs remembered. All right, one more school, one more, one more fresh group of five-year-olds, but this time the instruction, put the words, put the items in a sentence that asks a question. So the teacher holds up, sorry, the researcher holds up soap and shoe, she looks around the room, um, Camilla, uh, put the word soap and shoe in a sentence to ask a question. And five-year-old Camilla says, who put the soap in my shoe? Good. 21 questions. Kids go out and play for an hour, bring them back and test them. Compared to the first two groups, one, eight. How do you think this group did? I can see the numbers already. 16 out of 21 pairs remember. So look at these results side by side by side. And you tell me, what do you think the researchers concluded was happening in these kids' brains when they heard questions in test number three? It was happening not so much when they just heard a sentence in test number two. It was happening almost not at all when they just saw the pairs. Well, what happens when you hear a question? Well, you're probably saying to yourself, you answer it. You spontaneously answer it. This is human nature. Even if a question is not asked to us, we tend to answer. We tend to respond. So when, the, when Camilla said, who put the soap in my shoe? You know, the kids are sitting there thinking, oh, well, it was little Tommy while well, I wasn't looking, that trickster. And they start to construct in their minds the rudiments of a story where somebody is doing something to somebody else and there's an outcome. So triggered by questions, there was, first of all, a higher level of engagement. The kids' minds had to work. They had to answer the questions. But in answering the questions, 
They were inspired to construct stories to answer the question. And so this is what was happening out in that playground for an hour after they saw the 21 pairs, brought, bring them back in the room, hold up the, the panels, and only this time it says soap, and little Camilla sitting there thinking to herself, soap, soap, oh, that's right, Tommy put the soap in my shoe. Shoe! She had the other half of the pair, and they did it 16 out of 21 times. So the takeaway from this study, and this is relevant to everybody listening today, everybody watching, if you have some facts about your work that you would like people to remember, it is much more likely they'll remember those facts if they're contained within a story than if you just give them the facts. Stories help us remember. That's number one. Second, and I think even more important, stories influence how we think and behave. And the, the case I wanna give you here is around the issue of organ donation. Now, in the United States right now, uh, you can sign up to be an organ donor. I think when you renew your registration with the DMV, there's a box you can check. On average, about 56% uh, will check it, 56%. 44%, no thank you. Now, the people who don't check it, who decide not to be organ donors, they're not necessarily bad people. Um, some may actually have a medical excuse and can't. But a lot of people who choose not to have very strong reasons, very strong stories in their heads about why they're not going to donate. Who can tell me? What are the narratives? What are the stories that are circulating in people's heads about why they don't want to donate? Go ahead and put it in the chat box if you want. Why do you think people say, no, sorry, not for me? Go ahead and uh, let me see what kind of guesses we get here. Please guess because you're going to be right. These are very common. I see that. Yeah, there we go. There's some said religious beliefs, need them in the afterlife. Yeah, a lot of people think when I go to meet my maker, I got to be all there, right? How am I going to see St. Peter if I donate my eyes? Um, doctors won't work as hard to save me. A lot of people believe that uh, if you're in an accident, the emergency workers come to get you. Oh, so this guy's Sean. He's, a, he's in a car accident. Let's get him to the hospital. Oh, wait, he's an organ donor? Take the long way. <laughs> <laughs> is that my wife saying that <laughs> uh, here are the top four people think doctors emergency workers won't work as hard to save me religious beliefs i'm too old to donate you can be as old as 80 in many cases and they'll they'll take your organs and my personal favorite that it won't go to the most deserving person you know down the line that rich and famous people will will jump the line and my my liver will go to a kardashian you know that type of thing now, none of these are true. None of these are true, but people believe this. And as a result, uh, the need for organs far exceeds the supply. Let me show you some, some data. This is from, uh, from Donate Life America. Right now in the US, about 120,000 people are on a waiting list for an organ. The need so far exceeds the supply that look at that number in the middle, 22 people die every day <clears throat> waiting for an organ that's never coming. That's 22 tragedies a day. But if you go to these people who have said no, and you, you hit them with this data, do you know what they say? They say, oh gosh, that's a shame. Oh, so sorry to hear it. But religious beliefs, doctors won't work as hard to save me, um, Kardashian, you know, I'm too old, whatever, they're sticking with their story. So if we want to get more people to donate, how do we do it? <clears throat> Well, the answer is you have to give them a more powerful, more resonant story. Stories are like the software of the brain. They tell us what to let in and what to keep out, what we're gonna do and what we're not gonna do. So if you wanna change how people think and behave, sometimes you gotta change the software first. So how, so how do we do that? Well, let me show you one place where it was done and done brilliantly, and that's in Brazil. In the town, in the red box there, pronounced in Portuguese, Recife. Well, whether you've ever been to Recife or Brazil or South America, or you've never been, I'll bet you still know that in Recife, in Brazil, in South America, they're all crazy for the same thing, just nuts for the same thing. It's like a national continental religion. What is it? Yeah, football. Thank you, Alexander, football. What we in America, what we gringos call soccer, football, what the world calls football. And in Hasifi, people love 
the local team, Sport Club do Recife. You see the lion with the three stars? That's their logo. It's everywhere in town, everywhere. People love this team. People would die for this team. Well, hold on. There's a thought. If they would die for the team, would they donate their organs for the team? Well, believe it or not, this was, this was the genesis of a campaign where they went to the fans of this team specifically and said, if you truly love this team, you're, if you're really 100% behind us, then sign up for an organ donor card, looks like this, emblazoned with the logo of the team. And then should anything happen to you um, and you donate your organs and they go to someone else, your fandom will live on forever. You will become an immortal fan. That was the name of the campaign, Immortal Fans. And they said, they had another twist. They said, um, if you donate your organs and they go into the body of someone who roots for a rival team, you turn them into a fan of our team. So you, you may be chuckling, you may be laughing, etc. cetera. Um, this campaign was wildly successful, wildly successful. And I wanna show you a short video that chronicles the success of this campaign, how it turned around the story and dealt with the number one objection, which is familial consent. Take a look. Seus olhos vão continuar assistindo o esporte. Que os seus pulmões continuarão respirando pelo esporte. Prometo que o seu coração sempre baterá pelo esporte. Hoje a maior dificuldade que existe no processo de doação é o sim da família. Eu sou roubo negro até depois de morrer, irmão. Minha alma é roubo negro. Ainda mais que quando eu doar meus órgãos, pô, meu pulmão for pro cara do Nau, que eu sou do Nau, que vai respirar o esporte. A campanha atingiu um números impressionantes. 51 mil torcedores se declararam doadores. Uma quantidade superior à capacidade da Ilha do Retiro. A campanha do esporte... Eu não tenho dúvida alguma que se viu para que, aumentando a oferta de doadores, a gente conseguisse zerar essa lista, conseguisse realizar um transplante em todos os nossos Quanto foi a de doação de órgãos lançada pelo esporte está ajudando a salvar a vida de muitos torcedores. Antes do vídeo, eu tinha passado 18 anos de diabetes e 5 anos de pregnomotor. E agora você está melhorando, minha vida está voltando um pouquinho. There you go. Isn't that amazing? You saw that number, 51,000 people signed up for cards, the number well north of 60,000 now. Even better, sport clubs from Paris and Barcelona contacted them and said, how do we do that here? So I think this very clever idea is radiating around the globe.
But don't lose a larger point here because we're not talking about organ donation today and we're not talking about soccer. We're talking about how people think and behave and how we communicate. And the point I really want to make is reflected in Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. This is a great book. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend. But in this book, he says this, no one ever made a decision because of a number. They need a story. And please read that closely because what he is not saying and what I am not saying is we're not saying numbers don't matter. We're not saying that you don't need the data or the metrics, you do. But if you're in the business of changing how people think and behave, that process really more often than not starts with a story, a story that gets people nodding their head going, yes, that is the way the world works. I do see it that way. And then it's backed by data that says, and I have more than one story to tell you. You know, the way I like to say it is, if you're in the business of changing the world for the better, you are often first in the business of changing the stories in people's heads about the way the world works. So that's the case for storytelling. It helps you remember, so it sticks in your brain, and it changes the way people think and behave unlike any other form of communication, making it, I submit to you, the single most powerful communications tool any of us have available to us, bar none. So before we go on to the next section about specific stories you should tell, I wanna bring Sean back to talk to see if we have any questions uh, so far. And we do, and Andy, I uh, hope we encourage you to hear this. I was at a conference recently, a very small event, and every time we moved to a new topic, the first question before we even went into presentation was, what's the story, what's the narrative, what's the landscape, why? Good. They believe that changing anything required first changing, first understanding what the current story was and how you might repair or replace that story is something that people were oriented towards the change they wanted to see. It was really eye-opening. I had not seen that before. Okay, now some questions. We have five here. Remember, folks, you can vote for them. Francesca got the number one vote, so we're going to go with that one first. Andy, what types of stories or narratives are most effective at driving change? Are they fear-based? Are they motivational? Are they heartwarming? Do we know there's a certain type of story that works better than others? Um, I have to give you the all-purpose, never satisfying answer. It depends <laughs> because there are times when when fear is the driver and it, that can be very effective. There are times when hope is the driver and that can be very effective. I will tell you, I was at a conference recently where someone actually addressed this very question and said, you know, kind of fear versus hope, you know, which, which should we rely on? And the answer was, you know, it depends. But for long-term campaigns where you need long-term engagement, hope is generally the way to go because people will become numbed by fear. If you're constantly pressing the fear button, after a while people will kind of turn away and say, I can't, I can't do that on an everyday basis. For a, for a quick hit, yes, fear can get them to, to act. But for a long-term effort, like dealing with climate change, for example, hope is probably your, your better tool. Okay, Sadie has the next question. Uh, she says, great piece, but that's a warm and fuzzy narrative. I think she's referring to the, to the receipt bank piece we just watched. Now I get to keep my mom. But what about when it's a hard social issue that doesn't have a warm and fuzzy side? How do you tell a story about a tough subject? Well, you know, I, I, I want to know more about, about what kind of tough subject you're talking about. Um, because, you know, again, it, it, it all depends on the specifics. One thing I will say is, you know, we've worked with a lot of organizations that deal with vulnerable audiences in tough areas, uh, domestic violence, uh, drug abuse, um, poverty, et cetera, um, homelessness. And one of the things we counsel them in storytelling is that when you introduce characters in stories like this who are in very difficult circumstances, um, let's meet the person before we meet the label. Um, meet people uh, at a point in their life where we can identify them, perhaps when they're young and full of hopes and dreams like all of us, and then their life follows a path to something very difficult and challenging, but we follow them on that path as opposed to meeting them as a victim, as someone suffering, et cetera. So I'm not sure if this goes directly to your question, but um, I think that that's one of, the, one of the mistakes we make in storytelling is to introduce people in our stories who are already a label. They're already uh, fitting a certain description as opposed to being a person that we can meet and identify with who's in a place that can still be hopeful and positive. Okay, next question comes from our friend Ellen. She asks, how do you ensure that the story reveals systemic problems while telling an individual's story? How do you get to the, how do you go broad when you're when you're casting narrowly? 
Uh, you know, that, that's a, that's another very good question. Let, we'll just have to get back to sort of how stories work. You know, human beings uh, do not relate to organizations. They do not relate to policies. They do not relate to systemic change. People relate to people. And they even do it on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So if I'm going to tell you a story, I've got to start with somebody that the audience can meet and care about. Now, if we take it down to ground level and we meet somebody and we see what their challenge is, how they're doing, and our heart goes out to them, and we see how they, how they are helped or how they engage with an organization, get to a better place, then we can widen the lens and talk about the systemic changes that either let that happen or need to happen for that to happen. But storytelling starts down on the ground with individuals just by definition, and then we'll work our way back to systemic change. Okay, Rick asks, and we'll make this the last one because I know we have more to do. We'll take yes. the rest of the questions later, I promise. Uh, but Rick asks, is there an ideal length for an effective story? <laughs> yeah, again, here's your all purpose. It depends. Uh, if you're a very good storyteller, you can keep people wrapped for, for several minutes. And if you're a bad storyteller, 30 seconds is too long. So there's, there's no absolute here. I will say there's a general rule when we teach people and coach people how to tell stories. We try and tell them to try and keep them between two and three minutes. That, that seems to be kind of a sweet spot where most people will hang in with you. So if you're not sure if you're very good or very bad, you want to be somewhere in the middle, two to three minutes is a pretty good place to work for. Okay. Mandy, Sean, and Camille, I promise we will get your questions. Others, if you have them, go ahead and either add your questions or vote for the ones you see in that Q&A box. Let's go back into it. Thank you, Andy. This is awesome. Thanks, Sean. So let's talk about why leaders of change must tell three stories. And let's bring in the work of Marshall Gans, because this is the expert uh, to whom, to whom I, I defer and someone I consider, uh, I hold great respect for. Marshall Gans is currently a lecturer in public policy at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Um, if you've never heard of him, I, I urge you later on, Google him, look him up, et cetera. Let me give you a quick history of Marshall Gans and why I think he is worthy of your time and attention. Marshall Gans went to Harvard as an undergraduate in the early 1960s. I think he enrolled in 60 or 61, um, fully intending to graduate in four years. But in 1964, and there he is, a much younger man, he dropped out because he saw what was happening in the American South at this time. You know, this is the time of the marches in Selma and Montgomery, things happening in Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia. Um, and so he joined the Freedom Riders and went down South to fight for civil rights at a very turbulent and, and dangerous time. Uh, after doing that, he moved back to California, um, where his work was you know, so good, he was noticed by this man, Cesar Chavez, who reached out to him and said, I'm working to organize uh, farm workers, and I need some help. You know, will you work with me? And for 10 years, Gans became his right-hand man, uh, helping to organize uh, the farm workers in what was one of the most historic labor struggles this country ever saw. You know, Gans literally going with Chavez, you know, door to door, knocking on doors, urging farm workers to stand up and fight for their rights, telling them, you know, si se puede, yes we can, that's where it came from. After he did that for a number of years, he went independent, doing community uh, organizing, civil rights organizing all around the country, went back to Harvard, got his undergraduate degree, went to the Kennedy School to get his master's, and now, like I said, he's lecturing in public policy. So when Marshall Gans talks about leading change at a grassroots level, he, ta he talks from deep personal experience and, and many, many successful campaigns. And one of the things he says is that if you are going to lead change at any level within your organization, within your community, state, region, country, if you're going to lead change, there are three stories that you must tell. Three. And rather than put words in his mouth, I want to let you hear from Marshall Gans himself. A few years ago, Bill Moyers interviewed him. The full interview can be found on BillMoyers.com. But Bill Moyers asked him about these three stories. And Marshall Gans answered, here's what he said. Lauren, you've said that when you tell a story, the story becomes three stories. <laughs> yes. Well, when we do public, so public narrative is, is like a leadership skill of moving people to public action. So there's a story of self which is using narrative to communicate why I've been called. So I tell a story that can communicate the values that move me. A story of us is using narrative to create 
a sense of the values we share as a community. And then the story of now is do they experience the challenge to those values that requires action now? So sort of three, three pieces. All right, there's an awful lot there. So let's go back and just unpack that real quick. First story you have to tell is a story of self. If you're going to get up in front of people who don't already know you intimately and lead, they're going to want to know, well, who are you? What are, what are your values? What's your stake in this issue? Why should I even listen to you? So you've got to tell your story of self. You've got to put your stake in the ground and say, this is who I am. This is what I believe. This is what I think we should do. Once you've communicated that, then people want to know the story of us. Why are your values my values? What's the common ground we're standing on here? Why must we move forward together? And then you have to tell the story of now. What is the fierce urgency of now? Why is inaction no longer an option? Why must we do this thing now? So three stories. This is his model. And if this looks familiar to you, if this is kind of ringing any bells, you've seen this before. Uh, famously in 2004, at the Democratic National Convention, when Barack Obama put John Kerry's name into nomination, first term Senator Obama from Illinois was essentially introducing himself to the American people. So in that speech, he tells a story of self, us, and now. Obama very much an adherent to the GANS model. In fact, he had hired GANS to work on his 2008 and 2012 campaigns to train his troops in how to tell their stories and go out and represent themselves, represent the Obama campaign. More recently, uh, if you want a more recent example, there's this one. Um, back in, uh, this is actually March of last year, um, early in the campaign, um, CNN held a town hall with uh, Elizabeth Warren. And in the course of this town hall, Jake Tapper asked her this question, how did your family's financial problems during your childhood shape who you are today? Uh, Elizabeth Warren's gonna answer him in about three minutes and she's gonna tell all three stories. Uh, and she does it very artfully. So let's take a look at Elizabeth Warren doing this, this exercise of stories of self, us, and now. Take a look. I'll tell you about that. So I have three older brothers. They all went off and joined the military. That was their ticket to America's middle class. I was the late in life baby. My mother always just called me the surprise. Um, and about the time I was in middle school, um, my daddy had a heart attack, and it was serious. I thought he was going to die. Uh, the church neighbors brought covered dishes. It was a scary time. He survived, but he couldn't go back to work. And we lost our family station wagon. And at night, I hear my parents talk, and um, that's where I learned words like mortgage and foreclosure. And I remember the day that I walked into my parents' bedroom and laying out on the bed is the dress. And some people here will know the dress. It's the one that only comes out for weddings, funerals, and graduations. And my mother's in her slip and she's stocking feet and she's pacing back and forth and she's crying. She's saying, we will not lose this house. We will not lose this house. She was 50 years old. She'd never worked outside the home. She was truly terrified. And I watched her while she finally just pulled it together, put that dress on, put on her high heels, blew her nose and walked to the Sears and got a minimum wage job. And that minimum wage job saved our house, but more importantly, it saved our family. Anybody who wants to know me has just heard the story. But here's the thing for me now. For a long time, I used to think that was just a story about my mother. How when you get scared, you reach down, you find what you have to find and you bring it up. And then years later, I came to understand this is a story about millions of Americans who it doesn't matter if you're scared. When you gotta do something to take care of people you love, you reach down, you find it, and you pull it up.
And then it was years later that I came to understand it was also a story about government. Because when this happened to my family, the minimum wage in America would support a family of three. It would take care of a mortgage, utilities, and put food on the table. Today in America, a full-time minimum wage job will not keep a mama and a baby out of poverty. I am in this fight because I believe that is wrong. There you go. So just the story of self alone, that first portion, uh, before she gets into us and now, look at that, 259 words, a minute and 52. Look, look how concise that is. And I really wanna drill down on that because she does so many nice, so, so many smart things in this. And look, let's leave politics aside for a second. I don't care where your political interests lie. This is very good storytelling. And I wanna show you what she does because she does a lot with a little. Here's the first paragraph that she just, just said to Jake Tapper. Um, there's a thing in a in story of self called owning your own story. Uh, if I asked you, uh, Elizabeth Warren, uh, let's do a word association. Well, what would you shout out? Senator, Massachusetts, uh, professor, liberal, progressive, etc. You wouldn't say military family, would you? But she comes from a military family. That's the first thing she tells you. Um, that's a way of connecting with a lot, thousands of families out there who would never have thought, oh, she's one of us. Little self-deprecation there at the beginning. I was the late in life baby, the surprise. You heard her get a laugh on that. Uh, she's not saying, oh, my parents were just so happy to have me. They couldn't wait for me to be born. No, she was the surprise. Self-deprecation never hurts in, in story of self. Word choice is very important in storytelling. Uh, she refers to her father not as pops, not, not, as, not as pater. <laughs> my daddy. Um, being emotional and vulnerable. She talks about being a, you know, a middle school kid and thinking about, uh, about her, her dad dying. You know, uh, imagine that, you know, being that young and losing your father possibly. And then when you tell a story and it's just the words coming out of your mouth, like she had right there, specifics and things that are visual are very important. Three older brothers being in middle school, she didn't say the church neighbors were supportive. She said the church neighbors brought cover dishes, also church neighbors. Second paragraph. Again, owning your own story. She's an expert in things like foreclosure and mortgages and, and consumer protection, but she didn't learn all of that at Harvard. She learned it, she heard, first heard those words from her parents as a child. This goes very deep with her. The dress, the centerpiece of the story. The dress to showing that a family of such limited resources that one dress for all occasions, weddings, funerals, and graduations. Some of you will relate to the dress, she says. And again, being emotional and vulnerable, talking about her mom pacing back and forth and crying and those very specific visual details. And here's the wrap up of it. You know, dialogue, when you tell a story and the characters speak, it creates a sense of a scene. It pulls us in, creates a sense of immediacy. She didn't say, my mother was pacing back and forth talking to herself. She actually performs that for you. We will not lose this house. We will not lose this house. The specifics, 50 years old, the dress, blowing her nose. She doesn't go to the local business. She goes to the Sears. And that emotion about, you know, about just getting it together and going out there. You hear it. You can hear it in her voice and in the text itself. Emotion connects with the audience. And in case you missed it, she tells you, you've just heard my story of self. So it's all there. So these are the three stories that you need to tell as leaders of change. But really today, what we want to focus on is the story of self. That's what we really want you to work on. So what I want to do is I want to show you one more piece of Marshall Gans um, talking about this. Now, story of self um, is uh, how many people find it really easy to talk about themselves? Oh boy, there's an exceptional person. She's going to have a seminar afterwards. You can kind of, kind of talk to her. What is it that we're so reticent about? Huh? Oh boy, yeah. But we don't we say, I don't want to be immodest, right? So I don't want to toot my own horn. And I mean, there's a lot of 
the point is that, that in public life, you have no choice. See, we had a, a candidate ran for president a few years ago, John Kerry. People may remember that. He could never tell his own story. He had a great story. He could never tell it. So who told it for him? Swift voters, the opposition. See, either you claim authorship of your own story or others will. And that's the deal. So then the question is to learn how to tell your story. And it's a matter of drawing on those moments and experiences that you can share, that others can begin to see you and establish, it's not resume, you know, it's not, uh, it's not titles, it's experiences. But people can get you. See, in the story of us, you're trying to get them to get each other. In the story of now, it's about getting the urgent moment. But in the story of self, it's about getting you. Why are you here doing this? What do you care about? I saw Chelsea Fuller speak at a conference uh, not long ago. She works for Blackboard, Blackboard, a communication strategy firm. Look at what she said. We have to do this. It's incumbent on us to do this if we're going to lead. So we'd like to help you develop your story of self. We think this is a worthwhile e exercise for you to do as an individual, bring your team together and have them do it as well. So when we're all done, we're gonna make this template available to you. This is based on the work of Marshall Gans and it asks a series of questions, which hopefully will promote, uh, will provoke interesting thoughts that maybe you haven't had recently. Questions about your family history, about your parents, about growing up. Maybe this is where your story of self begins. Questions about your education and work history. Did, did, did the person you are today or the values you hold, did, did it start in school somewhere? Did it start in higher education? Did it start with the, the work that you chose? Uh, Marshall Gans talks about moments of hope and moments of pain. There may be these key moments in your life where you saw the path was clear or out of difficulty emerged uh, this, this sense of what you needed to do. And there might have been mentors or particular influences that, that put you on this path. This worksheet is to get you thinking about the elements that are critical to your story of self. So we're gonna make this available to you when we're all done. Uh, with that, uh, Sean, I think I wanna throw it back open um, for questions and comments. Let me do go there. So we have plenty of time for questions and I have one last thought I wanna share with you. Gotcha, we have a number of questions. Let's try to get to as many as we can, but also be mindful you have a plane to catch. All right, so let's start with uh, Mandy's question, which held over from a little bit earlier. In organizations doing broad work across a region, how do you suggest we prioritize the stories we tell? How do you prioritize stories? Well, again, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question directly, but I often get this question that, you know, as an organization, we do many different things. We have many different impacts. What story should we tell? And my answer is that uh, for everything that you do, there should be a story. Uh, every program that you have, all the impacts, all the things that make a difference. And that when you send people out in the world to talk about what you do, rather than going out with, you know, the elevator story, I'm more a believer in the quiver full of arrows. So that depending on who you're talking to and what their interests are, you can pull out the right story at the right time. So I say go out armed with a bunch of stories and then pull out the right one for the right person. All right, so an anonymous attendee, oh, come on, we're all friends, got to share your name here. An anonymous attendee, or Nani, as I like to call them, says in the GANS model, the last step is inaction is no longer an option. Now, the question is, do stories always need to include a call to action? Can it be to inform, to help our target audiences understand what we fund? Oh, where did that question go? Uh, okay, and who we are so that we know what kinds of projects to bring us? Yes. Oh, absolutely. The stories don't don't have to include a call to action. Um, you know, I'll, one of the things I tell organizations is there are many cues for stories on your websites. For example, uh, uh, many nonprofits will have a, a page on their website with our values, our core values, right? Innovation, uh, diversity, respect for all people, etc. And those are nice. Those are nice words, nice promises. But they just kind of sit there. And so one of the things I say to them is. If these are truly your core values, tell me stories of your people living and expressing those values where the point of the story, the moral of the story is, this is us respecting diversity. This is us being innovative. 
This is us being compassionate. So it's, there's no ask. It's just a story that shows these values in action. So yes, the short answer is stories do not have to include an ask. They're a very powerful tool to get you there, but stories can make a point more salient like a value. Right, and sometimes I would imagine the call to action is, I want to hear more. That, yeah. they are that gateway to help you get more involved, right? Absolutely. Uh, Anne asks, how do you use the story of self when you are not the subject of the story that you need to tell? Mara just adds on. I have the same question. I write stories for my organization, but my personal history is irrelevant. Well, I, I, I don't agree that your personal history is irrelevant. Look, you'll use, you'll use different stories at different times for different things. But I agree with Marshall Gans. If you are going to put yourself, if you are put in a position or you, are, you want to be in a position of leading change, where you're getting up in front of people, whether it's a group of people at work or people in your community, et cetera, they are going to want to know who are you and what are you all about? You know, there's a famous quote from Teddy Roosevelt uh, people don't care what you know until they know what you care, how, how much you care. Um, so people need to know this story about you. It's not for every situation, but for leaders of change, the story of self is essential. You will tell other stories, but this is, this is all about leading change. Okay, next question is from Sarah Carroll. It's similar to the one we just had, but let's go ahead after it anyway. A number of folks are curious about the answer. How do we tell the story of self if the story is not about ourselves? I'm particularly interested in how we give agency and ownership to the people whose own story, like the clients of a nonprofit, and how do we make sure these stories aren't the vivid examples that could strip the story owners of their agency? All right, well, we've got a couple of different questions there. Mm -hmm. uh, when we're telling the stories of the people that we serve, we do wanna make sure that we portray them, we show them with agency um, and how they're, you know, what they bring to the interaction with us. One of, the, one of the great mistakes we make in nonprofit storytelling is sort of the broken person model of storytelling. You know, broken person comes in contact with our organization, we fix them, they're better now, give us money. Um, that's, a, that's a problem area. And if I can point you to a website, ethicalstorytelling.com. This is a website where a lot of good thinkers have done a lot of work about how do we tell stories more ethically? How do we portray people with agency? How do we do uh, asset-based storytelling where we, we show what they bring and, and, and their, all their assets as opposed to deficit-based storytelling? That's a separate issue. Again, your story of self is for a particular purpose. Telling your story of self does not take away from all this. You're gonna, it's not either or, it's both and. You'll tell your story of self about why you do what you do, and you'll tell the stories of the people that you serve to show the, the specific work you do. You will tell both, but one does not take away from the other. Okay, next question comes from our friend Camille. Here we go. We know about the power and necessity of using video and images. What's the best way to effectively tell stories with text only? So if we're uh, not on Instagram, how do, we, how do we capture people's minds when we're writing? If it's on the web, uh, keep it short. You know as well as I do that when people are looking at a computer, they don't want to read 500 or 700 words. Some of the best storytelling I've seen on the web that wasn't video was really compelling pictures with, with short captions, essentially a slideshow. Um, uh, if, you are, if you're writing and you're putting out something in print, you know, a beautiful four color brochure and a report, then you have the leeway to, to write your 1500 word story with pictures and pull quotes and other things that make it more digestible. But on the web, brevity is, is your friend. And Sean, we just really can take one more because I do want to leave time for the closing. Yeah, okay, so one more question. And if you're looking for a great example of someone who's a really lovely multimedia version of all of that, the Bar Foundation's, not often I'm gonna say this, the Bar Foundation's annual report, mm -hmm. I just said it, an annual report look, worth looking at, Bar Foundation's annual report is absolutely excellent, highly recommended. Oh, I'll check it really out. Really beautiful storytelling uh, example of, of immersive storytelling in all of different forms. All right, so Sean asks a question. This is getting a little bit away from story of self to sort of storytelling more broadly, but it's a good one. Is there a particular arc to a story that you would recommend, especially if you have limited time or space to tell that story? Yeah, I mean, th there's, a, there's the basic three-act structure of storytelling where, you know, you introduce a protagonist, somebody who we get to know, who uh, wants something, runs into barriers along the way, has to deal with those obstacles, and ultimately ends up either achieving the goal, success, or not, 
and um, learns a lesson in, in, the, uh, in the process. It's the basic three act st structure of storytelling, what people sometimes refer to as a beginning, middle and end. In my experience working around the globe, it is the most commonly used form of storytelling. Not the only form, but the basic three act structure uh, is the most commonly used form. I think it's, it's the basically sort of the ABCs of storytelling. A okay, number of other questions. I think for now, mindful, Andy has an amazing story to take us out and he has a place to be. You can ask the rest of these questions on Twitter and Andy will get to them once he gets to where he's going or over the next couple of days, if you all have patience. We are also gonna be sharing that worksheet that he made for us, which I think will be tremendously helpful. All right, so with that, thank you for your patience. We've had a lot of folks. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but let's go ahead, Andy, you wanna take us out with the story? Yeah, I wanna talk about one last benefit uh, of the telling the story of self. The story of self, will connect you with audiences, and I think in a new and powerful way, but there's something else to be had here. And I learned this in my work with Dr. David Olds. If you never heard of Dr. David Olds, he is a pediatrician, a scientist by training, lives in Denver, and he started a program called the Nurse Family Partnership. And if you never heard of the Nurse Family Partnership, this is an amazing program that sends registered nurses into the homes of low-income, first-time families, often single moms, and these registered nurses visit these moms and these families through pregnancy, the birth of the child, and then regular visits through the first two years of the baby's life. And thanks to this intervention, the moms are healthier, the babies are healthier, the families are off to a stronger start, and they even have 15-year longitudinal studies where you can interview teenagers whose moms were home visited in this program, and those teenagers, doing better in school, staying off drugs, not in trouble with the police, their lives are on a better trajectory. It's a hugely successful program. So what's the problem? Well, when I went to work with them a few years ago and they would go out and talk about what they did, it was just <clears throat> data, 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 because that's what they had. It's an evidence-based program. They had tons of evidence. They couldn't wait to tell you. And they literally went out and just buried audiences in data. And we're wondering, why are people walking away bored? I don't get it. So um, they realized that we need to tell stories. We need to tell better stories about our work, about our nurses, et cetera. And our leading advocate, uh, David Oles, he needs to lead the way. He's the founder, he's the created the Oles model. He needs to be a better storyteller. So I went to work with him. And when I met David, um, I saw that he was, he's a scientist by training. This is who he is. And um, he's, he's not comfortable telling stories. It's all about data with him. I think his favorite expression was rigorous adherence to the model. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> whenever he talked about it, it's always rigorous adherence to the model. So I was like, okay, how do I, how do I help him uh, open up a little bit? And so at one point I asked him, I said, David, um, why did you create this program? Of all the things you could have do, done with your life, why this? And he kind of stopped and looked down and he said, well, he said, I graduated from Johns Hopkins in Baltimore in 1970. And he said at the time, you know, the 1970, we're coming out of the 60s. This is the, you know, the 1960s. We're all going to like change the world for the better. And um, he was one of those people. He said, I'm going to change the world for the better. There he is in 1970, a lot more hair. He said, I'm going to make the world a better place. And the first job he got out of Johns Hopkins was working at the Union Square Daycare Center, which was in this church, the, the basement of a church in this really rundown neighborhood. But we're gonna make the world a better place. I'm gonna work with kids. And he said, I'll never forget one of my first days there, this little boy came up to me to introduce himself and he was barking like a dog. Bark, 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 very cute. And David said, well, oh, hi, I'm David, what's your name? And the kid's just like, bark, 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 bark. And David realized after a while that this wasn't just barking. The kid was actually delayed. And David looked at his file to find out what happened and found out that his mother had done drugs during pregnancy. And that's why this child was in this situation today. And then there's another child that's stuck in his memory, a little boy named Bobby, who refused to go down at nap time. Uh, no matter how tired and cranky he was, he just wouldn't go down. And uh, David looked at his file to see if he could get a clue there and found out that this little boy, when he took naps at home, he would fall asleep and he would wet the bed and his mother would beat him. And so he was afraid that if he did this at the daycare center, he would get beaten. 
So David started to realize that um, these, these, he was feeling like we're just doing triage here. We're just picking up the pieces. And if only somebody could have gotten to these young families earlier with the advice and counsel that they needed, that maybe this wouldn't be happening. And in those moments, the seeds were sown for the, what would become the Nurse Family Partnership. So I asked him, I said, David, that's a, a, a very powerful story. Have you ever told that in a public setting? And he said, oh, no, 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 no. It's about the data. It's about the nurses, rigorous adherence to the model. And I said, David, that story is, it's your story of self. It's, it's why you do what you do. It's your values. Uh, I'd like you to share that. So a few weeks later, and it took great courage, and I'll give him, I want to give him all the props for that. Uh, he went and he told that story uh, at a very large gathering. And he came back. I said, how did it go? He said, well, he said, you know, two things happened. One that I kind of thought would happen, but the other caught me by surprise. He said, the thing that I thought would happen was that when I started to tell the story, it's like people like looked up from their phones, you know, they, they, started, they started to pay attention. He said, I really felt a connection with the room like I never felt before. He said, but I kind of thought if I told a story that would happen. He said, but the thing that caught me by surprise was that as I talked about the Union Square Daycare Center, I went back in my own, in my own heart to that time. I, I really, really felt it. And he said, I was more connected to myself than I have been in any presentation. This is what he said. He said, suddenly I was talking from my heart and not just from the mind, which is a hell of a statement for a, a scientist like David, David Olds. So ultimately, that's the last gift of the story of self. Not only do I think it will connect you more with the audiences that you want to reach and the people you want to lead, it'll connect you more with yourself. It'll remind you why you do what you do, because often we get so deep in the weeds that we kind of forget about it. So stopping once in a while and telling the story of self is a chance to relight that fire. And so if you'll do that, and I think for today, for this webinar, we can close the curtain, but this is definitely not the end. Thank you. Thank you for your time and attention. These are your takeaways. And if you get in touch, this is how you can reach me. Andy, thank you very much. We had 350, 360 folks with us. Thanks to all of you for turning up. You got into this because you were interested. You wanted to learn. You wanted to get better. I know I learned a lot over the last hour. So deep gratitude to Andy. Safe travels. Thank you. Uh, and I know on the other side of your travels, you're going to be doing more good just like this, helping some folks get better at this craft. Uh, we will, all the notes that Yabby took are on Twitter, ComNet Live. We will be back in April to talk about decolonizing narratives. Curious what that's about. We'll tell you soon. Uh, in the meantime, everybody who signed up for a breakout or web or breakout, a breakout or dialogue session for Comnet this year, thank you. We had our record number, and our plan is notwithstanding the way of the world just this moment, stay safe. Uh, our full expectation is we'll be gathering in Atlanta in September. Uh, we certainly hope we've invited Andy. I'm going to put him on the spot. I hope he's going to be with us. Um, and we will see you all very, very soon. In the meantime, do be well, take care of others, and uh, grateful for all that you do to help the world get a little bit better. Thanks much. We'll see you soon. Cheers.